Hello, it's Scott Manley here. After America learned to fly in space with Mercury, but before they learned to land on the moon with Apollo, there was Gemini, also known, wrongly, as Gemini. Gemini was very much a transition program, sending two astronauts to space where they would learn important skills such as EVA, orbital rendezvous, or docking. But today, I'm most interested in the fact that Gemini flew the first real computer in space. This computer was built by IBM in the mid-60s, and yeah, it was a marvel of miniaturization using transistor logic. It fit in a little bay to the left of where the, cap the commander sat. It massed about 27 kilos, 59 pounds. It was powered by 28 volt DC electricity. And apparently it was IBM's first computer to use entirely silicon semiconductor technology. It used core memory, which back then was the hot new thing. There were still computers using magnetic drum memory, which clearly isn't the best thing when you've got a spacecraft that's going to be moving around a lot. It would read data from a multitude of sensors around the spacecraft, synthesize them into data, and then you display that data via various other instruments. So I thought it would be fun to actually show you this in a simulator of the Gemini spacecraft. So this is a game that you can buy. It's called Re-Entry, and it lets you fly the Mercury, Apollo, and of course Gemini, and flip all the switches. Yes, all the way, the circuit breakers, all the way over there. Got all these controls here, got all the outputs, and of course you get some really nice renditions of crew members here if you want to imagine that you are a ghost secretly in the Gemini capsule. So, for the computer, the main controls are here. This is where you select the computer mode and start applications. This is the readout display that lets you look at data in the memory. There's the tape information here, which will tell you if the tape is being used. And then these displays here will display, will, will like respond to the computer and tell the, the commander what attitude and what delta V he needs to input. So uh, let's just turn the orbital maneuvering system off right now. So how do we interact with the computer? Well, over here, what we can do is ask it for important information about our orbit. So let's ask it about our apogee by putting in location 98 and hitting readout. So it tells us our apogee is 140.5 nautical miles. So if I clear that and hit 99 and read that out, it says our perigee is 121.1. So we are not in a circular orbit. So let's put our or let's circularize our orbit, right? So we'll switch into catch-up mode here. I'm not sure if that's necessary, but as we switch to catch-up mode, these are all the different computer modes here, right? And switching between these sometimes requires loads of data into memory. So uh, yeah, we are now <laughs> loading stuff into memory. So what what happens here is the tape light illuminates, telling us that the tape is busy. So yeah, let's talk about the Gemini computer. It had 4,096 words of memory. Those are 39-bit words, and they're kind of weird because they can either contain three instructions of 13 bits each or a single data value of 26 bits. That was all stored on magnetic core memory, which meant that after they read it, they had to immediately write it back to, to, because reading out destroyed the bits. The registers were implemented using glass delay lines. Uh, so if you don't know, a delay line is where you basically put an acoustic signal in at one end and it takes a finite amount of time to run to the other end. So if you do it fast enough, you can store like 26 pulses of sound on this piece of glass and read it off at the other end as a transducer. That's how delay line memory used to work. The tape was added later and they were very concerned about the reliability. So the data was read in four bit chunks. Well, that would be three bits plus a parity bit for verification. And then they would repeat the sequence three times. So you would have 12 bits read in just to get three bits of data into memory, which is why loading this took quite a while. So there's a lot of commonality between these programs. The same data would be available in the same locations, but there would be functionality that would be tuned for specific phases of the flight. So yeah, I'm running time a little faster in the uh, simulation, and I'm waiting for that green light to illuminate. If you look right straight ahead in the middle of this panel, by the way, there is the mission clock, and that, that's actually kind of important because a lot of things require high you know, accuracy timing. And the light has gone out. 
Great, so now we've loaded this in, let's ask the ground for a circularization burn at Apogee. And ground is reading up all this data to us. Now, the astronauts, what they would do is they would have these forms which they would fill out, right? And you can actually do that in the sim using the mouse to write numbers down here. So what you write in here, the purpose of this burn is Apogee circularization. The, prop the propulsion system is ohms and the guidance is the OBC, the onboard computer. The time of ignition is one hour and six minutes. So we've got about 15, just over well, 20 minutes to go. The time in seconds is 49.72 seconds. Delta V in the X direction is going to be 0, 0, 34.6 feet per second. The burn in Y is going to be all zeros. And the burn in Z is 9,000, which you might think is wacky. But the 9 is actually used because we don't have a minus sign. So this is actually minus 0, which makes a lot of difference. But yeah, that's how you put negative values in there. And the burn time is 17.29. Now, all these numbers are loaded into the computer for us. This light here tells us there's been an uplink from the ground. and We can turn this off these numbers here to actually tell us what the values are. So if I clear this out and do 0, 1 and hit readout, it'll tell us 106. Great. Uh, you can read out the seconds, 0, 2. Read out. And so the astronauts would have to check all these numbers and say they were wrong, right? Say um, say our, our delta Vy, right, so is 2, 6. Read that out, and it says zero on your weight. No, that's not supposed to be zero. It's supposed to be zero, zero, two, three, one. So you could then enter that into the computer memory. And then if you cleared it and read that out again, it would show the right value. Now, obviously, I want to make sure that doesn't go in. So I'm going to do two, six, one, two, three, four, five, enter. And then when I read it out, Oh, sorry, when I read it out, it's all zeros. Another important one is, I think it's 84? Or is it 85? <laughs> oh, you know, no. Actually, now that we've got the computer loaded, what we're supposed to do is start the computer running. And if I read this out, it tells us we have 21 minutes and 29 seconds before this burn happens. So we can get rid of our pad and we can start preparing for the burn. Now, one thing we can do is try to synchronize these numbers, right? See, if I hit this, the numbers are going down. Generally, the procedure is that you will uh, decrease this value until it gets to like 10 minutes and then trigger it 10 minutes before your burn. Oh. So this is kind of an annoying operation to do in the game. A really important thing to understand about the Gemini computer is that while it would track the numbers for you, you know, process the instruments, the crew were still pr responsible for performing the maneuvers. Oh, there, up, down, there, 10 minutes, okay. So now when 10 minutes come out, that's when we want this to happen. Now, kind of annoying, that's another way to do this, of course, is to read off the mission time and know that the mission time will have to be um, one one hour, six minutes, and uh, 49.72 seconds. So again, we can time accelerate. And that gives me a bit of time to actually talk about the performance of the computer again. So the instruction cycle time was 140 microseconds, which meant that it operated at about 7 kilohertz clock speed. There were 16 different opcodes the computer could use. And if you remember, I said there were three instructions in each 39-bit word. So that meant that each instruction was 13 bits. With 16 different instructions, you used four bits to encode those. And that left nine bits for the address. And the smart people out there are already realizing that with 4096 memory locations, nine bits isn't enough. So the memory is split into 256 word sectors. And that means you need eight bits from the instruction address to refer to one of those sectors, inside one of those sectors. And then the ninth bit can toggle between two different sectors. There's the current sector, which is being used where the code is running. And there's the residual sector, which is sitting at the end of memory. And that is used for putting all the variables and data that will be needed by all the code. And now I also said there's three instructions per word. So you might naively assume that it reads in a word and then executes each of the three instructions in sequence, but that's not what happens. 
Instead, the program only executes one of those instructions before going on to the next location in memory. And the specific instruction is set by like a syllable descriptor. So there's like three syllables in each word. So the way to think about it is there's basically three possible programs that could run from a section of memory, and it depends upon the syllable value that's set. So there's an important instruction called hop, which sets the current sector, the current syllable, and the program counter, and therefore jumps to this new address in memory. Okay, here we go. Uh, we missed our time. Let's let's start it. Our time's gone. We're, t we're going a little fast. Okay, we're a little late on that. Whatever. You know, while we're here, we probably need to set our attitude control. So we're going to set our attitude control relative to the platform. Uh, and we're going to set prograde, which is SEF. Turn on our maneuvering system, probably in the wrong order. And now the spacecraft is automatically orienting itself prograde. I know that I need prograde because I know this is a circularization burn. So you can watch this thing rotate around. And of course, at this point, they would have a whole lot, bunch of other checklists. They are all in the game if you want to do this. But uh, yeah, I'm going to just talk a little more about the computer design. So as I said, they had 16 instructions. There were uh, obviously arithmetic operations. There were actually two different types of uh, uh, subtract instruction, depending upon operand order. There was AND, there were some conditional jumps, there were some I.O. instructions, and of course there was a NO-OP. And that NO-OP is actually kind of important because the multiply and divide instructions, they took multiple instruction cycles. So you would execute a multiply and you would have to wait an extra cycle before you could get the result. And with a division, it would take four cycles before you could actually get the results of that. And during that time, you would actually typically do NO-OPs because if you had too many operations that hit the memory, that would actually make the memory heat up. And of course, thermal control is a big deal on spaceships. There are cooling loops that run through the avionics and ultimately the fluid ends up radiating heat through the skin. So for those of you wondering, by the way, uh, the computer is actually through that wall there. There's a space inside between the outside of the capsule and the commander seat that includes a bunch of avionics and the computer is in there. So as I was saying, all the uh, numerical operations take place on 26-bit values. Although when you multiply two numbers, that actually converts them into 24-bit numbers and then returns a 26-bit result. These are stored in the first two syllables of every data word. And there's a sort of interesting thing. That means the last 13 bits aren't used. And the way the computer was set up, there was actually a way to set up a hop instruction so you could actually read data from the last 13 bits. That's called half word mode, but it was never actually used apparently outside of testing in the lab. And in fact, the computers, when they were like shipped out to get used in the spacecraft, there was some way that they could actually disable being able to write to the top 13 bits of each word, and that's how they operated. So I guess they could still have instructions in those top 13 bits. Okay, we're coming up in the maneuver. The important thing to look at are these three numbers. These are my deltas. I have to get these to zero, and you'll notice the green lights show me which direction I need to make that correction. The Gemini capsule has thrusters that allow it to accelerate in all three axes, and the computer will translate those to these three different values, even if I rotate while performing the burn. But I think I'm pretty close now, so let's start performing a prograde burn. See, my numbers are going down. I want to get everything to zero, so I'll end up in the right orbit. That was supposed to be a 17 second burn and I did it early. One clue is that if you look at the computer panel in the bottom right, the green light for the computer, that extinguishes one minute before the burn and then it comes back on at the exact moment you're supposed to start the burn, just in case you haven't got your timer set up. Anyway, now I need to reset the computer and that will stop it updating the displays on the commander side and I can actually check my orbit using the computer. So 98 is going to be the apogee, and that says 140.5, good. Now the perigee, which we were raising, 99, and read out, and that is 139.9, yeah, that's, that's close, but it's not perfect. So that's one example of how the crew might interact with the computer, and an explanation for uh, you know, its capabilities, how it works. It would also be used with rendezvous, and docking, and re-entry, all to provide feedback to the pilot, so that they could actually perform the mission at hand. I should also make it clear that in re-entry, all the computer behavior is simulated. We don't actually have any code that ran on the onboard computer on Gemini. What we do have are these beautiful flowcharts for some of the stuff. This is like 
I kind of think it's beautiful because these charts, these flowcharts, they look like, you know, draftsmen have drawn up designs for a program like they would draw up designs for a part to be machined. These drawings predate the term software engineering. And, you know, there is a, there's definitely a beauty to them. Apparently, all this planning wasn't referred to as programs or programming. It was referred to as math flow. As far as we can tell, there aren't any other computers that were similar to Gemini. The launch vehicle digital computer on the Saturn V certainly shares some characteristics of its instruction set, but it is different enough that it doesn't, uh, it can't be compared. But beyond that, for a long time, we didn't have a great deal of information on the Gemini computer, despite its important place in spaceflight history. A lot of the information I talked about was compiled by a guy called Ronald Berkey. He's the guy that made the Apollo Guidance Computer web app, and he has been doing a stellar job of collecting and collating this information and talking to the original programmers as much as possible to try and rescue what knowledge there is. And I'm really grateful to that because I think that the Gemini computer is really important uh, part of spaceflight history. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.